Relax and listen to the voice. Rumble Stiltskin. Once there was a miller who was poor, but who had a beautiful daughter. Now it happened that he had to go and speak to the king, and in order to make himself appear important, he said to him, I have a daughter who can spin straw into gold. The king said to the miller, That is an art which pleases me well. If your daughter is as clever as you say, bring her tomorrow to my palace, and I will put her to the test. And when the girl was brought to him, he took her into a room, which was quite full of straw, gave her a spinning wheel and a reel, and said, Now set to work, and if by tomorrow morning, early you have not spun the straw to gold during the night, you must be put to death. Thereupon he himself locked up the room, and left her in it all alone. So there sat the poor miller's daughter, and for the life of her could not tell what to do. She had no idea how straw could be spun into gold, and she grew more and more frightened, until at last she began to weep. But all at once the door opened, and in came a little man, and said, Good evening, Mistress Miller. Why are you crying so? Alas, answered the girl, I have to spin straw into gold, and I do not know how to do it. What will you give me, said the mannequin, if I do it for you? My necklace, said the girl. The little man took the necklace, seated himself in front of the wheel, and whir, 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 three turns, and the reel was full. Then he put another on, and whir, 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 three times around, and the second was full too. And it so went until the morning, when all the straw was spun, and all the reels were full of gold. By daybreak the king was already there, and when he saw the gold he was astonished and delighted, but his heart became only more greedy. He had the miller's daughter taken into another room full of straw, which was much larger, and commanded her to spin that also in one night if she valued her life. The girl knew not how to help herself, and was crying, when the door opened again and the little man appeared and said, what will you give me if I spin that straw into gold for you? Well, the ring on my finger, answered the girl. The little man took the ring, and again began to turn the wheel, and by morning he had spun all the straw into glittering gold. The king rejoiced beyond measure at the sight, but still he had not enough gold, and he had the miller's daughter taken into a still larger room full of straw, and said, You must spin this too, in the course of the night, but if you succeed, you shall too be my wife. Even if she be a miller's daughter, thought he, I could not find a richer wife in the whole world. When the girl was alone, the mannequin came again for the third time and said, What will you give me if I spin the straw for you this time also? Well, I have nothing left that I could give, answered the girl. Then promise me, if you should become queen, to give me your first child. Who knows whether that will ever happen, though, thought the miller's daughter, and, not knowing how else to help herself in the street, she promised the man to him what he wanted, and for that he once more spun the straw into gold. And when the king came in the morning and found all as he had wished, he took her in marriage, and the pretty miller's daughter became a queen. A year after, she brought a beautiful child into the world, and she never gave a thought to the man again. But suddenly he came into her room and said, Now give me what you had promised. The queen was horror struck and offered the mannequin all the riches of the kingdom if he would leave her the child. But the mannequin said, No, something alive is dearer to me than all the treasures in the world. Then the queen began to lament and cry so that the mannequin pitied her. I will give you three days time, said he. If by that time you find out my name, then you shall keep your child. So the queen thought the whole night of all the names that she had ever heard, and she sent a messenger over the country to inquire far and wide for any other names that there might be. When the mannequin came the next day, she began with Caspar, Melchior, Althazar, and said all the names that she had known, one after another. But to every one the little man said, That is not my name. On the second day, she had inquiries made in the neighborhood as to the names of the people there, and she repeated to the mannequin, the most uncommon and curious, Perhaps your name is Short Ribs, or Sheepshanks, or Lace Leg. But he always answered, 
That is not my name. On the third day, the messenger came back again and said, I have not been able to find a single new name, but as I came to a high mountain at the end of the forest where the fox and the hare bid each other good night, there I saw a little house, and before the house a fire was burning, and round about the fire quite a ridiculous little man was jumping. He hopped upon one leg and shouted, Today I bake, tomorrow brew, the next I'll have the young queen's child. Ha! Glad am I that no one knew that Rumpelstiltskin I am styled. You may imagine how glad the queen was when she heard the name, and when soon afterwards the little man came in and asked, Now, Mistress Queen, what is my name? At first she said, Is your name Conrad? No. Is your name Harry? No. Well, perhaps your name is Rumpelstiltskin. The devil has told you that! The devil has told you that! cried the little man, and in his anger he plunged his right foot so deep into the earth that his whole leg went in, and then in a rage he pulled at his left leg so hard with both hands that he tore himself in two. Sweetheart Roland There was once upon a time a woman who was a real witch and had two daughters, one ugly and wicked, and this one she loved because she was her own daughter, and one beautiful and good, and this one she hated because she was her stepdaughter. The stepdaughter once had a pretty apron, which the other fancied so much that she became envious, and told her mother that she must and would have that apron. Be quiet, my child, said the old woman, and you shall have it. Your stepsister has long deserved death. Tonight, when she is asleep, I will come and cut her head off. Only be careful that you are at the far side of the bed and push her well to the front. It would have been all over for the poor girl if she had not just then been standing in the corner and heard everything. All day long she dared not go out of doors, and when bedtime had come, the witch's daughter got into the bed first, so as to lie at the far side, but when she was asleep, the other pushed her gently to the front, and took for herself the place at the back, close by the wall. In the night the old woman came creeping in. She held an axe in her right hand, and felt with her left to see if anyone were lying at the outside, and then she grasped the axe with both hands, and cut her own child's head off. When she had gone away, the girl got up and went to her sweetheart, who was called Roland, and knocked at his door. When he came out, she said to him, Listen, dearest Roland, we must fly in all haste. My stepmother wanted to kill me, but has struck her own child. When daylight comes and she sees what she's done, we shall be lost. But, Roland said, I counsel you first to take away her magic wand, or we cannot escape if she pursues us. The maiden fetched the magic wand, and she took the dead girl's head and dropped three drops of blood on the ground, one in front of the bed, one in the kitchen, and one on the stairs. Then she hurried away with her lover. When the old witch got up the next morning, she called her daughter and wanted to give her the apron, but her daughter did not come. Then the witch cried, Where are you? Here, on the stairs. I am sweeping, answered the first drop of blood. The old woman went out, but saw no one on the stairs and cried again, Where are you? Here, in the kitchen. I am warming myself, cried the second drop of blood. The witch went into the kitchen, but found no one. Then she cried again, Where are you? Ah, I'm here in bed. I'm sleeping, cried the third drop of blood. She went into the room to the bed. What did she see there? Her own child, whose head she had cut off, bathed in her blood. The witch fell into a passion, sprang to the window, and as she could look forth quite far into the world, she perceived her stepdaughter hurrying away with her sweetheart Roland. That shall not help you, cried she. Even if you have got a long way off, you shall still not escape me. She put on her many league boots, in which she covered an hour's walk at every step, and it was not long before she overtook them. 
The girl, however, when she saw the old woman striding towards her, changed with her magic wand, her sweetheart Roland, into a lake, and herself into a duck swimming in the middle of it. The witch placed herself on the shore, threw breadcrumbs in, and went to endless trouble to entice the duck. But the duck did not let herself be enticed, and the old woman had to go home at night as she had come. At this, the girl and her sweetheart Roland resumed their natural shapes again, and they walked on the whole night until daybreak. Then the maiden changed herself into a beautiful flower which stood in the midst of a briar hedge, and her sweetheart Roland into a fiddler. It was not long before the witch came striding up towards them, and said to the musician, Dear musician, may I pluck that beautiful flower for myself? Oh yes, he replied, I will play to you while you do it. As she was hastily creeping into the hedge and was just going to pluck the flower, knowing perfectly well who the flower was, he began to play, and whether she would or not, she was forced to dance, for it was a magical dance. The faster he played, the more violent springs she was forced to make, and the thorns tore her clothes from her body and pricked her and wounded her till she bled, and as she did not stop, she had to dance till she lay dead on the ground. As they were now set free, Roland said, now I will go to my father and arrange for the wedding. Then, in the meantime, I will stay here and wait for you, said the girl. And that no one may recognize me, I will change myself into a red stone landmark. Then Roland went away, and the girl stood like a red landmark in the field and waited for her beloved. But when Roland got home, he fell into the snares of another, who so fascinated him that he forgot the maiden. The poor girl remained there a long time, but at length, as he did not return at all, she was sad, and changed herself into a flower, and thought, Someone will surely come this way, and trample me down. It befell, however, that a shepherd kept his sheep in the field, and saw the flower, and as it was so pretty, he plucked it, took it with him, and laid it away in the chest. From that time forth, strange things happened in the shepherd's house. When he arose in the morning, all the work was already done, the room was swept, and the table and benches were cleaned. The fire on the hearth was lighted, and the water was fetched, and at noon, when he came home, the table was laid, and a good dinner served. He could not conceive how this came to pass, for he never saw a human being in his house, and no one could have concealed themselves in it. He was certainly pleased with this good attendance, but still, at last, he was so afraid that he went to a wise woman and asked for her advice. The wise woman said, There is some enchantment behind it. Listen very early some morning, if anything is moving in the room, and if you see anything, no matter what it is, throw a white cloth over it, and then the magic will be stopped. The shepherd did as she bade him, and next morning, just as day dawned, he saw the chest open, and the flower came out. Swiftly he sprang towards it, and threw a white cloth over it. Instantly the transformation came to an end and a beautiful girl stood before him, who admitted to him that she had been the flower, and that up to this time she had attended to his housekeeping. She told him her story, and as she pleased him, he asked her if she would marry him, but she answered no, for she wanted to remain faithful to her sweetheart Roland, although he had deserted her. Nevertheless, she promised not to go away, but to continue keeping house for the shepherd. And now the time drew near when Roland's wedding was to be celebrated, and then, according to an old custom in the country, it was announced that all the girls were to be present at it and sing in honor of the bridal pair. When the faithful maiden heard of this, she grew so sad that she thought her heart would break, and she would not go thither, but the other girls came and took her. When it came to her turn to sing, she stepped back, until at last she was the only one left, and she could not refuse. But when she began her song, and it reached Roland's ears, he sprang up and cried, I know the voice. That's the true bride. I will have no other. Everything he had forgotten, and which had vanished from his mind, had suddenly come home again to his heart. Then the faithful maiden held her wedding with her sweetheart Roland, and grief came to an end, and their joy began. The Golden Bird 
In olden times, there was a king who had behind his palace a beautiful pleasure garden in which there was a tree that bore golden apples. When the apples were getting ripe, they were counted, but on the very next morning, one was missing. This was told to the king, and he ordered that the watch should be kept every night beneath the tree. The king had three sons, the eldest of whom he sent, as soon as night came on, into the garden. But when midnight came, he could not keep himself from sleeping, and next morning again, an apple was gone. The following night, the second son had to keep watch, but it fared no better with him. As soon as twelve o'clock had struck, he fell asleep, and in the morning, an apple was gone. Now it came to the turn of the third son to watch, and he was quite ready, but the king had not much trust in him, and he thought that he would be of less use even than his brothers, but at last he let him go. The youth lay down beneath the tree, but kept awake, and did not let sleep take over him. When it struck twelve, something rustled through the air, and in the moonlight he saw a bird coming whose feathers were all shining with gold. The bird alighted on the tree, and had just bucked off an apple when the youth shot an arrow at him. The bird flew off, but the arrow had struck his plumage, and one of his golden feathers fell down. The youth picked it up, and the next morning took it to the king and told him what he had seen in the night. The king called his council together, and everyone declared that a feather like this was worth more than the whole kingdom. If the feather is so precious, declared the king, one alone will not do for me. I must and will have the whole bird. The eldest son set out, and trusting to his cleverness, thought that he would easily find the golden bird. When he had gone some distance, he saw a fox sitting at the edge of the wood, so he cocked his gun and took aim at him. The fox cried, Do not shoot me, and in return I will give you some good counsel. You are on the way to the golden bird, and this evening you will come to a village in which stand two inns opposite one another. One of them is lighted up brightly, and all goes on merrily within, but do not go into it. Go rather into the other, even though it looks like a bad one. How can such a silly beast give wise advice, thought the king's son, and he pulled the trigger, but he missed the fox, who stretched out his tail and ran quickly into the wood. So he pursued his way, and by evening came to the village where the two inns were. In one, they were singing and dancing, and the other had a poor, miserable look. I should be a fool indeed, he thought, if I were to go into the shabby tavern and pass by the good one. So he went into the cheerful one, lived there in riot and revel, and forgot the bird and his father, and all good counsels. When many months had passed, and the eldest son did not come back home, the second set out, wishing to find the golden bird. The fox met him as he had met the eldest, and gave him the good advice of which he took no heed. He too came to the two inns, and his brother was standing at the window of the one from which came the music, and called out to him. He could not resist, but went inside, and lived only for pleasure. Again, some time passed, and the king's youngest son wanted to set off and try his luck, but his father would not allow it. It is of no use, said he. He will find the golden bird still less than his brothers, and if a mishap were to befall him, he knows not how to help himself. He's not too bright at the best. But at last, as he had no peace, he let his son go. Again, the fox was sitting outside the wood, and begged for his life, and offered his good advice. The youth was good-natured and said, Be easy, little fox. I will do you no harm. You shall not repent it, answered the fox, and that you may get on more quickly, get up behind on my tail. And scarcely had he seated himself when the fox began to run, and away he went, over stock and stone, till his hair whistled in the wind. When they came to the village, the youth got off. He followed the good advice, and without looking round, turned into the little inn, where he spent the night quietly. The next morning, as soon as he got into the open country, there sat the fox already, and said, I will tell you further what you have to do. Go on quite straight, and at last you will come to a castle, in front of which a whole regiment of soldiers is lying. But do not trouble yourself about them, for they will all be asleep and snoring. Go through the midst of them, straight into the castle, and go through all the rooms, 
Till at last you will come to a chamber where a golden bird is hanging in a wooden cage. Close by there stands an empty gold cage for show, but beware of taking the bird out of the common cage and putting it in the fine one, or things may go badly for you. With these words, the fox again stretched out his tail, and the king's son seated himself upon it, and away he went, over stock and stone, until his hair whistled in the wind. When he came to the castle, he found everything just as the fox had said. The king's son went into the chamber where the golden bird was shut up in a wooden cage, whilst the golden one stood by, and the three golden apples lay about the room. But, thought he, it would be absurd if I were to leave the beautiful bird in a common and ugly cage. So he opened the door, lay hold of it, and put it into the golden cage. But at the same moment the bird uttered a shrill cry. All of the soldiers awoke, rushed in, and took him off to prison. The next morning he was taken before a court of justice, and as he confessed everything, he was sentenced to death. The king, however, said that he would grant him his life on one condition, namely, if he brought him the golden horse which ran faster than the wind, and in that case he should receive over and above as a reward the golden bird. The king's son set off, but he sighed and he was sorrowful, for how was he to find the golden horse? But all at once he saw his old friend the fox sitting on the road. Look you, said the fox, this has happened because you did not give heed to me. However, be of good courage, I will give you my help and tell you how to get to the golden horse. You must go straight on and you will come to a castle where in the stable stands the horse. The grooms will be lying in front of the stable, but they will be asleep and snoring and you can quietly lead out the golden horse. But of the one thing you must take heed, put on him the common saddle of wood and leather, and not the golden one which hangs close by, else it will go very ill with you. The fox stretched out his tail. The king's son seated himself upon it. Away they went, over stock and stone, until his hair whistled in the wind. Everything happened just as the fox had said. The prince came to the stable in which the golden horse was standing, but just as he was going to put the common saddle upon him, he thought, Such a beautiful beast will be shamed if I do not give him the good saddle which belongs to him by right. But scarcely had the golden saddle touched the horse than he began to neigh loudly. The grooms awoke, seized the youth, and threw him into prison. The next morning he was sentenced by the court to death, but the king promised to grant him his life, and the golden horse as well, if he could bring back the beautiful princess from the golden castle. With a heavy heart the youth set out, yet luckily for him he soon found the trusty fox. I ought to only leave you to your ill luck, said the fox, but I pity you and will help you once more out of your trouble. This road takes you straight to the golden castle. You will reach it by even tide, and at the night when everything is quiet, the princess goes to the bathing house to bathe. When she enters it, run up to her and give her a kiss. Then she will follow you and you can take her away with you. Only do not allow her to take leave of her parents first, or it will go ill with you. The fox stretched out his tail, the king's son seated himself upon it, and away went the fox over stock and stone until his hair whistled in the wind. When he reached the golden castle, it was just as the fox had said it would be. He waited until midnight, when everything lay in deep sleep, and the beautiful princess was going to the bathing house. Then he sprang out and gave her a kiss. She said that she would like to go with him, but she asked him pitifully and with tears to allow her to first take leave of her parents. At first he withstood her prayer, but when she wept more and more and fell at his feet, he at last gave in. No sooner had the maiden reached the bedside of her father than he and all the rest of the castle awoke, and the youth was laid hold of and put into prison. The next morning the king said to him, Your life is forfeited, and you can only find mercy if you take away the hill which stands in front of my windows and prevents my seeing beyond it, and you must finish it all within eight days. If you do that, you shall have my daughter as your reward. 
With that, the king's son began, and dug and shoveled without stopping. But when, after seven days, he saw how little he had done, and how all of his work was as good as nothing, he fell into a great sorrow and gave up all hope. But on the evening of the seventh day, the fox appeared and said, You do not deserve that I should take my trouble about you, but just go away and lie down and sleep. I will do the work for you. The next morning when he awoke and looked out of the window, the hill had gone. The youth ran, full of joy to the king, and told him that the task was fulfilled, and whether he liked it or not, the king had to hold his word and give him his daughter. So the two set forth together, and it was not long before the trusty fox came up with them. You have certainly got what is best, said he. But the golden horse also belongs to the maiden of the golden castle. Why well, should I get it? asked the youth. That I will tell you, answered the fox. First take the beautiful maiden to the king who sent you to the golden castle. There will be unheard of rejoicing. They will gladly give you the golden horse and will bring it out to you. Mount it as soon as possible and offer your hand to all in farewell. Last of all to the beautiful maiden, and as soon as you have taken her hand, swing her up on the horse and gallop away, and no one will be able to bring you back, for the horse runs faster than the wind. All was carried out successfully, and the king's son carried off the beautiful princess on the golden horse. The fox did not remain behind, and he said to the youth, Now I will help you to get the golden bird. When you come near to the castle, where the golden bird is to be found, let the maiden get down, and I will take her into my care. Then ride with the golden horse into the castle yard. There will be great rejoicing at the sight, and they will bring out the golden bird for you. As soon as you have the cage in your hand, gallop back to us and take the maiden away again. When the plan had succeeded, and the king's son was about to ride home with his treasures, the fox said, Now you shall reward me for my help. Well, what do you require for it? asked the youth. When you get into the wood yonder, shoot me dead and chop off my head and feet. Well, that would be some fine gratitude, said the king's son. Well, I cannot possibly do that for you. The fox said, if you will not do it, I must leave you, but before I go away, I will give you a piece of good advice. Be careful about two things. Buy no gallows flesh, and do not sit at the edge of any well. And with that, the fox ran into the wood. The youth thought, that is a wonderful beast. He has strange whims. Who on earth would want to buy gallows flesh? As for the desire to sit at the edge of a well, it has never yet occurred to me. He rode on with the beautiful maiden, and his road took him again through the village in which his two brothers had remained. There was a great stir and noise, and when he asked what was going on, he was told that two men were going to be hanged. As he came nearer to the place, he saw that they were his brothers who had been playing all kinds of wicked pranks and had squandered all of their wealth. He inquired whether they could not be set free. If you will pay for them, answered the people, but why should you waste your money on wicked men and buy them free? He did not think twice about it, but paid for them, and when they were set free, they all went on their way together. They came to the wood where the fox had first met them, and as it was a hot day, but cool and pleasant within the wood, the two brothers said, Let us rest a little by the well, and eat and drink. He agreed, and whilst they were talking, he forgot himself, and he sat down upon the edge of the well without thinking of any evil. But the two brothers threw him backwards into the well, took the maiden, the horse, and the bird, and went home to their father. Here, we bring you not only the golden bird, said they, we have won the golden horse also, and the maiden from the golden castle. Then was their great joy, but the horse would not eat, the bird would not sing, and the maiden sat and wept. But the youngest brother was not dead. By good fortune, the well was dry, and he fell upon soft moss without being hurt, but he could not get out again. 
Even in this strait, the faithful fox did not leave him. It came and leapt down to him and upbraided him for having forgotten its advice. But yet I cannot give up, he said. I will help you up again into daylight. He made him to grasp his tail and keep hold of it tight, and then he pulled him up. You are not out of all danger yet, said the fox. Your brothers were not sure of your death and have surrounded the wood with watchers who are to kill you if you let yourself be seen. But a poor man was sitting on the road with whom the youth changed clothes, and in this way he got to the king's palace. No one knew him, but the bird began to sing, the horse began to eat, and the beautiful maiden left off weeping. The king, astonished, asked, What does this mean? Then the maiden said, I do not know, but I have been so sorrowful, and now I am so happy. I feel as if my true bridegroom has come. She told him all that had happened, although the other brothers had threatened her with death if she were to betray anything. The king commanded that all people who were in his castle should be brought before him, and amongst them came the youth in his ragged clothes, but the maiden knew him at once and fell upon his neck. The wicked brothers were seized and put to death. He was married to the beautiful maiden and declared heir to the king. But what happened to the poor fox, you might ask? Long afterwards, the king's son was once again walking in the wood when the fox met him and said, You have everything now that you can wish for, but there is never an end to my misery, and yet it is in your power to set me free. And again, he asked him with tears to shoot him dead and chop off his head and his feet. So the king's son did it, and scarcely was it done when the fox was changed into a man and was no other than the brother of the beautiful princess, who at last was freed from the magic charm which had been laid upon him. And now they had all the happiness they wanted for as long as they lived. The Two Brothers There were once upon a time two brothers, one rich and the other poor. The rich one was a goldsmith and evil-hearted. The poor one supported himself by making brooms and was good and honorable. He had two children, who were twin brothers, and as like each other as two drops of water. The two boys went in and out of the rich house and often got some of the scraps to eat. It happened once when the poor man was going into the forest to fetch brushwood that he saw a bird which was quite golden and more beautiful than any he had ever chanced to meet with. He picked up a small stone, threw it at it, and was lucky enough to hit it, but one golden feather only fell down, and the bird flew away. The man took the feather and carried it to his brother, who looked at it and said, It is pure gold, and gave him a great deal of money for it. Next day, the man climbed into a birch tree and was about to cut off a couple of branches when the same bird flew out, and when the man searched, he found a nest, an eggly inside of it, which was of gold. He took the egg home with him and carried it to his brother, who again said, It is pure gold, and gave him what it was worth. At last, the goldsmith said, I should indeed like to have the bird itself. The poor man went into the forest for the third time and again saw the golden bird sitting in the tree. So he took another stone, threw it, and brought the bird down and carried it to his brother, who gave him a great heap of gold for it. Now I can get on, thought he, and he went contentedly home. The goldsmith was crafty and cunning and knew very well what kind of bird it was. He called his wife and said, Roast me the gold bird and take care that none of it is lost. I have a fancy to eat it all myself. The bird, however, was no common one, but of so wondrous a kind that whosoever ate its heart and liver found every morning a piece of gold beneath his pillow. The woman prepped the bird, put it on the spit, and let it roast. Now it happened that while it was on the fire, and the woman was forced to go out of the kitchen on account of some other work, the two children of the poor broom maker ran in, stood by the spit, and turned it round once or twice. And as at that very moment two little bits of the bird fell down into the pan, one of the boys said, We will eat those two little bits, 
I am so hungry, and no one will ever miss them. Then the two ate the pieces, but the woman came into the kitchen and saw that they were eating something and said, What have you been eating? Two little morsels which fell out of the bird, answered they. That must have been the heart and the liver, said the woman, quite frightened, and in order that her husband might not miss them and be angry, she quickly killed a young cock, took out his heart and liver, and put them beside the golden bird. When it was ready, she carried it into the goldsmith, who consumed it all alone, and left none of it. Next morning, however, when he felt beneath his pillow and expected to bring out the piece of gold, no more gold pieces were there than there had always been. The two children did not know what a piece of good fortune had fallen to their lot. Next morning, when they arose, something fell rattling to the ground, and when they picked it up, there were two gold pieces. They took them to their father, who was astonished, and said, How can that have happened? When the next morning, again, they found two more, and so on daily, he went to his brother and told him the strange story. The goldsmith at once knew how it had happened, and that the children had eaten the heart and liver of the golden bird, and in order to revenge himself, and because he was envious and hard-hearted, he said to the father, Your children are in a league with the evil one. Do not take the gold, and do not suffer them to stay any longer in your house, for he has them in his power, and may ruin you likewise. The father feared the evil one, and painful as it was to him, he nevertheless led the twins forth into the forest, and with a sad heart left them there. And now the two children ran about the forest and sought the way home again, but they could not find it, and only lost themselves more and more. At length they met with a huntsman who asked, to whom do you children belong? We are the poor broom maker's boys, they replied, and they told him that their father would not keep them any longer in the house, because a piece of gold lay every morning under their pillows. Come, said the huntsman, that is nothing so very bad, if at the same time you remain honest and are not idle. As the good man liked the children, and had none of his own, he took them home with him and said, I will be your father, and bring you up till you are big. They learnt huntsmanship from him, and the pieces of gold which each of them found when he awoke was kept for them by him in case they should need it in the future. When they were grown up, their foster father one day took them into the forest with him and said, Today shall you make your trial shot, so that I may release you from your apprenticeship and make you huntsman. They went with him to lie in wait and stayed there a long time, but no game appeared. The huntsman, however, looked above him and saw a covey of wild geese flying in the form of a triangle, and he said to one of them, Shoot me down one from each corner. He did it, and thus accomplished his trial shot. Soon after, another covey came flying by in the form of the figure two, and the huntsman bade the other also bring down one from each corner, and his trial shot was likewise successful. Now, said the foster father, I pronounce you out of your apprenticeship. You are skilled huntsmen. Therefore the two brothers went forth together into the forest, and took counsel with each other, and planned something. And in the evening, when they had sat down to supper, they said to their foster father, We will not touch food, or take one mouthful, until you have granted us a request. We have now finished learning, and we must prove ourselves in the world, so allow us to go away and travel. Then spoke the old man joyfully, You talk like brave huntsmen. That which you desire has been my wish. Go forth, all will go well with you. Thereupon they ate and drank joyously together. When the appointed day came, their foster father presented each of them with a good gun and a dog, and let each of them take as many of his saved up gold pieces as he had chosen. Then he accompanied them part of the way, and when taking leave he gave them a bright knife and said, if you ever separate, stick this knife into a tree at the place where you part, and when one of you returns, he will be able to see how his absent brother is faring, for the side of the knife which is turned in the direction by which he went will rust if he dies, but will remain bright as long as he is alive. The two brothers went still farther onwards, and came to a forest which was so large that it was impossible for them to get out of it in one day. So they passed the night in it, and ate what they had put in their hunting pouches, but they walked all the second day, likewise, and still did not get out. As they had nothing to eat, one of them said, We must shoot something for ourselves, or we shall suffer from hunger, and loaded his gun, and looked about him. 
and when an old hare came running up towards them, he laid his gun on his shoulder, but the hare cried, Dear huntsman, but do let me live. Two little ones to thee I'll give, and sprang instantly into the thicket and brought out two young ones. But the little creatures played so merrily and were so pretty that the huntsmen could not find it in their hearts to kill them. They therefore kept them with them, and the little hares followed on foot. Soon after this, a fox crept past. They were just going to shoot it, but the fox cried, Dear huntsman, but do let me live. Two little ones thee I will give. He too brought two little foxes, and the huntsman did not like to kill them either, but gave them to the hares for company, and they followed behind. It was not long before a wolf strode out of the thicket. The huntsman made ready to shoot him, but the wolf cried, Dear huntsman, but do let me live. Two little young ones that thee I give. The huntsman put the two wolves beside the other animals, and they followed behind them. Then a bear came who wanted to trot about a little longer and cried, Dear huntsman, do but let me live. Two little ones to thee I'll give. The two young bears were added to the others, and there were already eight of them. Then who should come? A lion came, and he tossed his mane. But the huntsmen did not let themselves be frightened, and aimed their guns at him likewise. But the lion also said, Dear huntsman, do but let me live. Two little ones to thee I'll give. And he brought his little ones to them. And now the huntsman had two lions, two bears, two wolves, two foxes, and two hares, who followed them and served them. In the meantime, their hunger was not appeased by this, and they said to the foxes, Listen, you sneakers, provide us with something to eat. You're crafty and cunning. They replied, Not far from here lies a village, from which we have already brought many a fowl. We will show you the way there. So they went into the village, bought themselves something to eat, had some food given to their beasts, and then they traveled onwards. The foxes knew their way very well about the district and where the poultry yards were, and were able to guide the huntsmen. Now they had traveled about for a while, but could find no situation where they could remain together, so they said, There is nothing else for it. We must part. They divided the animals so that each of them had a lion, a bear, a wolf, a fox, and a hare. Then they took leave of each other, promised to love each other like brothers till their death, and stuck the knife which their foster father had given them into a tree, after which one went east and the other went west. The younger, however, arrived with his beasts in a town which was all hung with black crepe. He went into an inn and asked the host if he could accommodate his animals. The innkeeper gave him a stable where there was a hole in the wall, and the hare crept out and fetched himself the head of a cabbage, and the fox fetched himself a hen, and when he had devoured it, got the cock as well. But the wolf, the bear, and the lion could not get out because they were too big. Then the innkeeper let them be taken to a place where a cow happened to be lying on the grass that they might eat till they were satisfied. And when the huntsman had taken care of his animals, he asked the innkeeper why the town was thus hung with black crepe. Said the host, Because our king's only daughter is to die tomorrow. The huntsman inquired, Is she sick unto death? No, answered the host. She is vigorous and healthy. Nevertheless, she must die. Well, how is that? asked the huntsman. There is a high hill without the town, whereon dwells a dragon, who every year must have a pure virgin, or he lays the whole country to waste. And now all the maidens have already been given to him, and there is no longer anyone left but the king's daughter. Yet there is no mercy for her. She must be given up to him, and that is to be done tomorrow. Said the huntsman, Why is the dragon not killed? Ah, replied the host, So many knights have tried it, but it has cost all of them their lives. The king has promised that he who conquers the dragon shall have his daughter to wife, and shall likewise govern the kingdom after his own death. The huntsman said nothing more to this, but next morning took his animals, and with them ascended the dragon's hill. A little church stood at the top of it, and on the altar three cups were standing, with the inscription, Whosoever empties the cups will become the strongest man on earth, and will be able to wield the sword which is buried before the threshold of the door. The huntsman did not drink, 
but went out and sought for the sword in the ground, but was unable to move it from its place. Then he went in and emptied the cups, and now he was strong enough to take up the sword, and his hand could quite easily wield it. As the hour came when the maiden was to be delivered over to the dragon, the king, the marshal, and the courtiers accompanied her. From afar she saw the huntsman on the dragon's hill, and thought it was the dragon standing there waiting for her, and did not want to go up to him. But at last, because otherwise the whole town would have been destroyed, she was forced to take the fatal journey. The king and courtiers returned home full of grief. The king's marshal, however, was to stand still and see all from a distance. When the king's daughter got to the top of the hill, it was not the dragon which stood there, but the young huntsman, who comforted her and said he would save her. He led her into the church and locked her in. It was not long before the seven-headed dragon came thither with loud roaring. When he perceived the huntsman, he was astonished and said, What business have you here on the hill? The huntsman answered, I want to fight with you, said the dragon. Many knights have left their lives here. I shall soon have made an end of you too. And then he breathed fire out of seven jaws. The fire was to have lighted the dry grass, and the huntsman was to have been suffocated in the heat and smoke, but the animals came running up and trampled out the fire. Then the dragon rushed upon the huntsman, but he swung his sword until it sang through the air and struck off three of his heads. Then the dragon grew really furious and rose up in the air and spat out flames of fire over the huntsman and was about to plunge down on him, but the huntsman once more drew out his sword and again cut off three of his heads. The monster became faint and sank down. Nevertheless, it was just able to rush upon the huntsman when he, with his last strength, smote its tail off, and as he could fight no longer, he called up his animals who tore it into pieces. When the struggle was ended, the huntsman unlocked the church and found the king's daughter lying on the floor as she had lost her senses with anguish and terror during the contest. He carried her out, and when she came to herself once more, he opened her eyes, he showed her the dragon all cut to pieces, and he told her that she was now set free. She rejoiced and said, Now you will be my dearest husband, for my father has promised me to him who kills the dragon. Thereupon she shook off her necklace of coral, and divided it amongst the animals in order to reward them, and the lion received the golden clasp. Her pocket handkerchief, however, on which was her name, she gave to the huntsman, who went and cut the tongues out of the dragon's seven heads, wrapped them in the handkerchief, and preserved them carefully. That done, as he was so faint and weary with the fire and the battle, he said to the maiden, We are both faint and weary. We will sleep a while. Then she said yes, and they lay down on the ground, and the huntsman said to the lion, You shall keep watch, that no one surprises us in our sleep. And both of them fell asleep. The lion lay down beside them to watch, but he also was so weary with the fight that he called to the bear and said, Lie down near me. I must sleep a little. If anything comes, waken me. Then the bear lay down beside him, but he also was tired, and he called the wolf and said, Lie down by me. I must sleep a little, but if anything comes, waken me. Then the wolf lay down by him, but he was tired likewise and called the fox and said, Lie down by me, I must sleep a little. If anything comes, waken me. Then the fox lay down beside him, but he too was weary, and he called the hare and said, Lie down by me, I must sleep a little, and if anything should come, waken me. Then the hare sat down by him, but the poor hare was tired too, and he had no one whom he could call there to keep watch and he ended up falling asleep. And now the king's daughter, the huntsman, the lion, the bear, the wolf, the fox, and the hare were all sleeping a sound sleep. The marshal, however, who was to look on from the distance, took courage when he did not see the dragon flying away with the maiden, and finding that all the hill had become quiet, he ascended it. There lay the dragon, hacked and hewn to pieces on the ground, and not far from it were the king's daughter and a huntsman with his animals, and all of them were sunk in a sound sleep. 
And as he was wicked and godless, he took his sword, cut off the huntsman's head, and seized the maiden in his arms, and carried her down the hill. Then she awoke, and she was terrified. But the marshal said, You are in my hands. You shall say that it was I who killed the dragon. Well, I cannot do that, she replied, for it was the huntsman with his animals who did it. Then he drew his sword, and he threatened to kill her if she did not obey him, and so compelled her that she promised it. Then he took her to the king, who did not know how to contain himself for joy, when he once more looked on his dear child and wife, whom he had believed to have been torn to pieces by the monster. The marshal said to him, I have killed the dragon, and delivered the maiden, and the whole kingdom as well. Therefore I demand her as my wife. The king said to the maiden, Is what he says true? Oh yes, she answered. It must indeed be true, but I will not consent to have the wedding celebrated until after a year and a day, for she thought that in this time she could hear something of her dear huntsman. The animals, however, were still lying sleeping beside their dead master on the dragon's hill, and there came a great bumblebee and lighted on the hare's nose, but the hare wiped it off with its paw and went on sleeping. The bumblebee came a second time, but the hare again rubbed it off and slept on. Then it came for the third time and stung his nose so that he awoke. As soon as the hare was awake, he roused the fox, and the fox, the wolf, and the wolf, the bear, and the bear, the lion. And when the lion awoke and saw that the maiden was gone and his master was dead, he began to roar frightfully and cried, Who has done that? Bear, why did you not waken me? The bear asked the wolf, Why did you not waken me? And the wolf, the fox, Why did you not waken me? And the fox, the hare, Why did you not waken me? The poor hare alone did not know what answer to make, and the blame rested with him. Then they were just going to fall upon him, but he entreated them and said, Kill me not, I will bring our master to life again. I know a mountain on which a root grows, which, when placed in the mouth of any one, cures him of all illness and every wound. But the mountain lies two hundred hours journey from here. The lion said, In four and twenty hours must you have run thither and have come back, and have brought the root with you. Then the hare sprang away, and in four and twenty hours he was back, and brought the root with him. The lion put the huntsman's head on again, and the hare placed the root in his mouth, and immediately everything united back together, and his heart beat, and life came back. Then the huntsman awoke, and was alarmed when he did not see the maiden, and thought, oh, She must have gone away whilst I was sleeping, in order to get rid of me. The lion, in his great haste, had put his master's head on the wrong way around, but the huntsman did not observe it, because of his melancholy thoughts about the king's daughter. But at noon, when he was going to eat something, he saw that his head was turned backwards and could not understand it, and he asked the animals what had happened to him in his sleep. Then the lion told him that they too had all fallen asleep from weariness, and on awaking had found him dead with his head cut off, that the hare had brought the life-giving root, and that he, in his haste, had laid hold of the head the wrong way, but that he would repair his mistake. Then he tore the huntsman's head off again, turned it around, and then the hare once again healed it with a root. The huntsman, however, was sad at heart, and traveled about the world, and made his animals dance before people. It came to pass that precisely at the end of one year he came back to the same town where he had rescued the king's daughter from the dragon, and this time the town was gaily hung with red cloth. Then he said to the host, well, What does this mean? Last year the town was all hung with black crepe. What means the red cloth today? The host answered, Last year our king's daughter was to have been delivered over to the dragon, but the marshal fought with it and killed it, and so tomorrow their wedding is to be solemnized, and that is why the town was hung with black crepe for mourning, and tis today covered with red cloth for joy. The next day, when the wedding was to take place, the huntsman said at midday to the innkeeper, Do you believe, sir host, that I, while with you here today, shall eat bread from the king's own table? Nay, said the host, I would bet a hundred pieces of gold that that will not come true. The huntsman accepted the wager, and set against it a purse, with just the same number of gold pieces. Then he called the hare and said, Go, my dear runner, and fetch me some of the bread, which the king is eating. 
Now the little hare was the lowest of the animals and could not transfer this order to any of the others, but he had to get on his legs himself. Alas, thought he, if I bound through the streets thus alone, the butchers and the dogs will be after me. It happened just as he had expected, and the dogs came after him and wanted to make holes in his good skin, but he sprang away. You have never seen the like, and sheltered himself in a sentry box without the soldier being aware of it. Then the dogs came and wanted to have him out, but the soldier did not understand the jest, and struck them with the butt end of his gun till they ran away, yelling and howling. As soon as the hare saw that the way was clear, he ran into the palace and straight to the king's daughter, sat down under her chair, and scratched at her foot. Then she said, Will you get away? and thought it was her dog. The hare scratched her foot for the second time, and she said again, Will you get away? And she thought it was still her dog. But the hare did not let itself be turned from its purpose, and it scratched her for the third time. Then she peered down, and knew the hare by its collar. She took him up on her lap, carried him into her chamber, and said, Dear hare, what do you want? He answered, My master who killed the dragon is here, and he has sent me to ask for a loaf of bread like that which the king eats. Then she was full of joy, and had the baker summoned, and ordered him to bring a loaf such as was eaten by the king. The little hare said, But the baker must likewise carry it thither for me, that the butchers and the dogs may do me no harm. The baker carried it for him as far as the door of the inn, and then the hare got on his hind legs, took the loaf in his front paws, and carried it to his master. Then said the huntsman, Behold, sir host, the hundred pieces of gold are mine. The host was astonished, but the huntsman went on to say, Yes, sir host, I have the bread, but now I will likewise have some of the king's roast meat. The host said, mm, I should indeed like to see that but he would make no more wagers. The huntsman called the fox and said, My little fox, go and fetch me some roast meat, such as a king eats. The red fox knew the byways better, and went by holes and corners without any dog seeing him. He seated himself under the chair of the king's daughter, and scratched at her foot. Then she looked down and recognized the fox by its collar, took him into her chamber with her, and said, Dear fox, what do you want? He answered, my master who killed the dragon is here, and he has sent me. I am to ask for some roast meat, such as the king is eating. Then she made the cook come, who was obliged to prepare a roast joint, the same as was eaten by the king, and carry it for the fox as far as the door. Then the fox took the dish, waved away with his tail the flies which had settled on the meat, and then carried it to his master. Behold, sir host, said the huntsman, Bread and meat are here, but now I will also have proper vegetables with it, such as are eaten by the king. Then he called the wolf and said, Dear wolf, go thither and fetch me vegetables, such as the king eats. Then the wolf went straight to the palace, as he feared no one, and when he got to the king's daughter's parlor, he tugged at the back of her dress, so that she was forced to look around. She recognized him by his collar, and took him into her chamber with her, and said, Dear wolf, what is it that you want? He answered, My master who killed the dragon is here. I am to ask for some vegetables such as the king eats. Then she made the cook come, and he had to make ready a dish of vegetables, just as the king ate, and had to carry it for the wolf as far as the door. And then the wolf took the dish from him, and carried it to his master. Behold, sir host, said the huntsman, now I have bread and meat and vegetables, but I will also have some pastry to eat, like that which the king eats. He called the bear and said, Dear bear, you are fond of licking anything sweet. Go and bring me some confectionery, such as the king eats. The bear trotted to the palace, and everyone got out of his way. But when he went to the guard, they presented their muskets, and they would not let him go into the royal palace. But he got up on his hind legs and gave them a few boxes on the ears, right and left with his paws, so that the whole watch broke up, and then he went straight to the king's daughter, placed himself behind her, and growled a little. Then she looked behind her, knew the bear, and bade him to go into her room with her, and said, Dear bear, what do you want? He answered, My master who killed the dragon is here, and I am to ask for some confectionery such as the king eats. Then she summoned her confectioner, who had to bake the confectionery such as the king ate, and carry it to the door for the bear. 
Then the bear first licked up the comfits which had rolled down, and then he stood upright, took the dish, and carried it to his master. Behold, sir host, said the huntsman, now I have bread, meat, vegetables, and confectionery, but I will drink wine also, and such as the king drinks. He called his lion to him and said, Dear lion, you yourself like to drink till you are tipsy. Go and fetch me some wine, such as is drunk by the king. The lion then strode through the streets, and the people fled from him, and when he came to the watch, they wanted to bar the way against him, but he did but roar once, and they all ran away. Then the lion went to the royal apartment, and knocked on the door with his tail. The king's daughter came forth, and was almost afraid of the lion, but she knew him by the golden clasp of her necklace, and bade him to go with her into the chamber, and said, Dear lion, what will you have? He answered, my master who killed the dragon is here, and I am to ask for some wine such as is drunk by the king. Then she bade the cupbearer be called, who was to give the lion some wine like that which was drunk by the king. The lion said, I will go with him and see that I get the right wine. Then he went down with the cupbearer, and when they were below, the cupbearer wanted to draw him some of the common wine that was drunk by the king's servants, but the lion said, Stop! I will taste the wine first, and he drew a half measure and swallowed it down at one draught. No, said he, that is not right. The cupbearer looked at him askance, but went on, and was about to give him some of another barrel, which was for the king's marshal. The lion said, Stop, let me taste the wine first, and he drew half a measure and drank it. Oh, that is better, but still not right, said he. Then the cupbearer grew angry, and said, How can a stupid animal like you understand wine? But the lion gave him a blow behind the ears, which made him fall down by no means gently, and when he had gotten up again, he conducted the lion quite silently into the little cellar apart, where the king's wine lay, from which no one ever drank. The lion first drew half a measure and tried the wine, then he said, That may possibly be the right sort and he bade the cupbearer to fill six bottles of it. And now they went upstairs again, but when the lion came out of the cellar into the open air, he reeled here and there, and he was rather drunk, and the cupbearer was forced to carry the wine as far as the door for him, and then the lion took the handle of the basket in his mouth, and took it to his master. The huntsman said, Behold, sir host, here I have bread, meat, vegetables, confectionery, and wine, such as the king has, and now I will dine with my animals. And he sat down and ate and drank, and gave the hare, the fox, the wolf, the bear, and the lion also to eat and drink, and was joyful, for he saw that the king's daughter still loved him. And when he had finished his dinner, he said, Sir host, now that I have eaten and drunk, as the king eats and drinks, I will go to the king's court and marry the king's daughter. Said the host, how can that be, when she already has a betrothed husband, and when the wedding is to be solemnized today? Then the huntsman drew forth the handkerchief which the king's daughter had given him on the dragon's hill, and in which were folded the monster's seven tongues, and said, That which I hold in my hand shall help me to do it. Then the innkeeper looked at the handkerchief and said, Whatever I believe, I do not believe that, and I am willing to stake my house and courtyard on it. The huntsman, however, took a bag with a thousand gold pieces, put it on the table, and said, I stake that on it. Now the king said to his daughter at the royal table, What did all the wild animals want which have been coming to you and going in and out of my palace? She replied, I may not tell you, but send and have a master of these animals brought, and you will do well. The king sent a servant to the inn, and invited the stranger, and the servant came just as the huntsman had laid his wager with the innkeeper. Then said he, Behold, sir host, now the king sends his servant and invites me, but I do not go in this way. And he said to the servant, I request that the lord king to send me royal clothing, and a carriage with six horses, and servants to attend to me. When the king heard the answer, he said to his daughter, What shall I do? She said, Cause him to be fetched as he desires to be, and you will do well. Then the king sent royal apparel, a carriage with six horses, and servants to wait on him. When the huntsman saw them coming, he said, Behold, sir host, now I am fetched as I desired to be, 
and he put on the royal garment, took the handkerchief with the dragon's tongues with him, and drove off to the king. When the king saw him coming, he said to his daughter, How shall I receive him? She answered, Go to meet him, and you will do well. Then the king went to meet him, and let him in, and his animals followed. The king gave him a seat near himself and his daughter, and the marshal, as bridegroom, sat on the other side, but no longer knew the huntsman. And now at this very moment, the seven heads of the dragon were brought in as a spectacle, and the king said, The seven heads were cut off of the dragon by the marshal, wherefore today I give him my daughter to wife. Then the huntsman stood up, opened the seven mouths, and said, Where are the seven tongues of the dragon? Then was the marshal terrified, and grew pale, and knew not what answer he should make, and at length in his anguish he said, Dragons have no tongues. The huntsman said, Liars ought to have none, but the dragon's tongues are the tokens of the victor, and he unfolded the handkerchief, and there lay all seven inside of it, and he put each tongue in the mouth to which it belonged, and it fitted exactly. Then he took the handkerchief on which the name of the princess was embroidered, and showed it to the maiden, and asked to whom she had given it, and she replied, To him who had killed the dragon. And then he called his animals, and took the collar off each of them, and the golden clasp from the lion, and showed them to the maiden, and asked to whom they belonged. She answered, The necklace and the golden clasp were mine, but I divided them among the animals who helped to conquer the dragon. Then spoke the huntsman, when I, tired of the fight, was resting and sleeping, the marshal came and cut off my head. Then he carried away the king's daughter, and gave out that it was he who had killed the dragon, but that he lied, I prove with the tongues, the handkerchief, and the necklace. And then he related how his animals had healed him by means of a wonderful root, and how he had traveled about with them for one year, and had at length come there, and had learnt the treachery of the marshal by the innkeeper's story. Then the king asked his daughter, Is it true that this man killed the dragon? And she answered, Yes, it is true. Now I can reveal the wicked deed of the marshal, as it has come to light without my connivance, for he wrung from me a promise to be silent. For this reason, however, did I make the condition that the marriage should not be solemnized for a year and a day. Then the king bade twelve counselors be summoned, who were to pronounce judgment on the marshal, and they sentenced him to be torn to pieces by four bulls. The marshal was therefore executed, but the king gave his daughter to the huntsman, and named him his viceroy over the whole kingdom. The wedding was celebrated with great joy, and the young king caused his father and his foster father to be brought, and loaded them with treasures. Neither did he forget the innkeeper, but sent for him and said, Behold, sir host, I have married the king's daughter, and your house and yard are mine. The host said, Yes, according to justice it is so. But the young king said, It shall be done according to mercy, and told him that he should keep his house and yard, and gave him a thousand pieces of gold as well. And now the young king and queen were thoroughly happy, and lived in gladness together. He often went out hunting because it was a delight to him, and the faithful animals had to accompany him. In the neighborhood, however, there was a forest of which it was reported that it was haunted, and that whoever did but enter it did not easily get out again. But the young king had a great inclination to hunt in it, and he let the old king have no peace until he allowed him to do so. So he rode forth with a great following, and when he came to the forest, he saw a snow-white hind, and said to his men, Wait here until I return. I want to hunt that beautiful creature. And then he rode into the forest after it, followed only by his animals. The attendants halted and waited until evening, but he did not return. So they rode home, and they told the young queen that the young king had followed a white hind into the enchanted forest, and had not come back out again. Then she was in the greatest concern about him. He, however, had still continued to ride on and on after the beautiful wild animal, and had never been able to overtake it. When he thought he was near enough to take aim, he instantly saw it bound away into the far distance, and at length it vanished altogether. And now he perceived that he had penetrated deep into the forest, and blew his horn, but he received no answer from his men, for his attendants could not hear it. 
and as night was falling, he saw that he could not get home that day, so he dismounted from his horse, lighted himself a fire near a tree, and resolved to spend the night by it. While he was sitting by the fire, and his animals were also lying down beside him, it seemed to him that he heard a human voice. He looked around, but he could not perceive anything. Soon afterward, he heard a groan as if from above, and then he looked up and he saw an old woman sitting in the tree who wailed unceasingly. Oh, 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 how cold am I? Said he, come down and warm yourself if you are cold. But she said, no, your animals will bite me. He answered, they will do you no harm, old mother. Do come down. She, however, was a witch and said, I will throw down a wand from the tree, and if you strike them all on the back with it, they will do me no harm. Then she threw him a small wand, and he struck them with it, and instantly they lay still and were turned into stone. And when the witch was safe from the animals, she leapt down and touched him also with the wand, and changed him to stone. Thereupon she laughed and laughed, and dragged him and the animals into a vault, where many more such stones already lay. As the young king did not come back at all, the queen's anguish and care grew constantly greater, and it so happened that at this very time, the other brother, who had turned to the east when they separated, came into the kingdom. He had sought a situation, and had found none, and had then traveled about here and there, and had made his animals dance. Then it came into his mind that he would just go and look at the knife that they had thrust into the trunk of the tree at their parting, that he might learn how his brother was. When he got there, his brother's side of the knife was half rusted and half bright. Then he was alarmed and thought, Oh, a great misfortune must have befallen my brother, but perhaps I can still save him, for half of the knife is still bright. He and his animals traveled towards the west, and when he entered the gate of the town, the guard came to meet him and asked if he was to announce him to his consort, the young queen who had for a couple of days been in the greatest sorrow about his staying away and was afraid he had been killed in the enchanted forest. The sentries indeed thought no otherwise than that he was the young king himself, for he looked so like him and had wild animals running behind him. Then he saw that they were speaking of his brother and thought, it will be better if I so pass myself off for him and then I can rescue him more easily. So he allowed himself to be escorted into the castle by the guard and was received with the greatest joy. The young queen indeed thought that he was her husband, and asked him why he had stayed away so long. He answered, I had lost myself in a forest, and I couldn't find my way out any sooner. At night, he was taken to the royal bed, but he laid a two-edged sword between him and the young queen. She did not know what that could mean, but did not venture to ask. He remained in the palace a couple of days, and in the meantime inquired into everything which related to the enchanted forest, and at last he said, I must hunt there once more. The king and the young queen wanted to persuade him not to do it, but he stood out against them, and went forth with a larger following. When he had gotten into the forest, it fared with him as with his brother. He saw a white hind and said to his men, Stay here, and wait until I return. I want to chase the lovely wild beast. And then he rode into the forest, and his animals ran after him. But he could not overtake the hind, and he got so deep into the forest that he was forced to pass the night there. And when he had lighted a fire, he heard someone wailing above him. Oh, 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 how cold am I? Then he looked up, and the selfsame witch was sitting in the tree. Said he, If you are cold, come down, little old mother, and warm yourself. She answered, No, your animals will bite me. But he said, They will not hurt you. Then she cried, I will throw down a wand to you, and if you smite them with it, they will do me no harm. When the huntsman heard that, he had no confidence in the old woman, and said, I will not strike my animals. Come down, or I will fetch you. Then she cried, What do you want? You shall not touch me. But he replied, If you do not come, I will shoot you. Shoot away, said she. I do not fear your bullets. Then he aimed and fired at her. But the witch was proof against all leaden bullets, and laughed shrilly and cried, You shall not hit me. 
The huntsman knew what to do. He tore three silver buttons off of his coat and loaded his gun with them, for against them her arts were useless, and when he fired she fell down at once with a scream. Then he set his foot on her and said, Old witch, if you do not instantly confess to me where my brother is, I will seize you with both of my hands and throw you into this fire. She was in a great fright. She begged for mercy and said, He and his animals lie in the vault. They're turned to stone. Then he compelled her to go thither with him, threatened her and said, Old sea cat, now you shall make my brother and all the human beings lying here again alive, or you shall go directly into that fire. She took the wand and touched the stones, and then his brother, with his animals, came to life again, and many others, merchants, artisans, and shepherds, they all arose, thanked him for their deliverance, and went to their homes. When the twin brothers saw each other again, they kissed each other and rejoiced with all of their hearts. Then they seized the witch, bound her and laid her on the fire, and when she was burnt, the forest opened of its own accord and was light and clear, and the king's palace could be seen at about the distance of a three hours walk. Thereupon the two brothers went home together, and on the way they told each other of their histories. And when the younger brother said that he was the ruler of a whole country in the king's stead, the other observed, and remarked very well, for when I came to town, and was taken for you, all royal honors were paid to me. The young queen looked on me as her husband, and I had to eat at her side and slept in your bed. When the other heard that, he became so jealous and angry that he drew his sword and struck off his brother's head. But when he saw him lying there dead, and saw his red blood flowing, he repented most violently. My brother delivered me, cried he, and I have killed him for it and he bewailed him aloud. Then his hair came and offered to go and bring some of the root of life, and bound it away and brought it while yet there was still time, and the dead man was brought to life again, and he knew nothing about the wound. After this they journeyed onwards, and the younger said, You look like me, you have royal apparel on as I have, and the animals follow you as they do me. We will go in by opposite gates, and arrive at the same time from the two sides in the aged king's presence. So they separated, and at the same time came the watchmen from the one door and from the other, and announced that the young king and his animals had returned from the chase. The king said, It is not possible. The gates lie quite a mile apart. In the meantime, however, the two brothers entered the courtyard of the palace from opposite sides, and both mounted the steps. Then the king said to the daughter, Say which one is your husband. Each of them looks exactly like the other. I cannot tell. Then she was in great distress, and could not tell, but at last she remembered the necklace which she had given to the animals, and she sought for it and found her little golden clasp on the lion, and she cried in her delight, He who was followed by this lion is my true husband. Then the young king laughed and said, Yes, he is the right one. And they sat down together to the table, and ate and drank, and were merry. At night, when the young king went to bed, his wife said, Why have you for these last nights always laid a two-edged sword in our bed? I thought you had a wish to kill me. It was at that point he knew how true his brother had always been. The Queen Bee Two king's sons once went out in search of adventures, and fell into a wild, disorderly way of living, so that they never came home again. The youngest, who was called Simpleton, set out to seek his brothers, but when at length he found them, they mocked him for thinking that he, with his simplicity, could get through the world, when they too could not make their way, and yet they were so much cleverer. They all three traveled away together, and came to an ant hill. The two elders wanted to destroy it, to see the little ants creeping about in their terror, and carrying their eggs away, but Simpleton said, Leave the creatures in peace, I will not allow you to disturb them. Then they went onwards and came to a lake, on which a great number of ducks were swimming. The two brothers wanted to catch a couple and roast them, but Simpleton would not permit it and said, Leave the creatures in peace, I will not suffer you to kill them. 
At length they came to a bee's nest in which there was so much honey that it ran out of the trunk of the tree where it was. The two wanted to make a fire beneath the tree and suffocate the bees in order to take away the honey, but Simpleton again stopped them and said, Leave the creatures in place. I will not allow you to burn them. At length the three brothers arrived at a castle where stone horses were standing in the stable and no human being was to be seen and they went through all the halls until quite at the end they came to a door in which there were three locks. In the middle of the door, however, there was a little pane through which they could see into the room. There they saw a little gray man who was sitting at a table. They called him once, called him twice, but he did not hear. At last they called for him a third time when he got up, opened the locks, and came out. He said nothing, however, but conducted them to a handsomely spread table, and when they had eaten and drunk, he took each of them to a bedroom. The next morning the little gray man came to the eldest, beckoned to him, and conducted him to a stone table, on which were inscribed three tasks, by the performance of which the castle could be delivered from enchantment. The first was that in the forest, beneath the moss, lay the princess's pearls, a thousand in number, which must be picked up, and if by sunset one single pearl was missing, he who had looked for them would be turned into stone. The eldest went thither, and sought the whole day, but when it came to an end, he had only found one hundred, and what was written on the tablet came true, and he was thus turned into stone. The next day, the second brother undertook the adventure, but it did not fare much better with him than with the eldest. He did not find more than two hundred pearls, and was changed into stone. At last, it was Simpleton's turn to seek in the moss, but it was so difficult for him to find the pearls, and he got on so slowly that he seated himself on a stone and wept. And while he was thus sitting, the king of the ants, whose life he had once saved, came with five thousand ants, and before long the little creatures had got all the pearls together and laid them in a heap. The second task, however, was to fetch out of the lake the key of the king's daughter's bedchamber. When Simpleton came to the lake, the ducks which he had saved swam up to him, dived down, and brought the key out of the water. But the third task was the most difficult. From amongst the three sleeping daughters of the king was the youngest and dearest to be sought out. They, however, resembled each other exactly, and were only to be distinguished by their having eaten different sweetmeats before they had fallen asleep. The eldest had a bit of sugar, the second a little bit of syrup, and the youngest a spoonful of honey. Then the queen of the bees, whom Simpleton had protected from the fire, came and tasted the lips of all three, and at last she remained sitting on the mouth which had eaten the honey, and thus the king's son recognized the right princess. Then the enchantment was at an end. Everything was delivered from sleep, and those who had been turned to stone received once more their natural forms. Simpleton married the youngest and sweetest princess, and after her father's death, Simpleton became the king, and his two brothers received the two other sisters. The Golden Goose There was a man who had three sons, the youngest of whom was called Dumbling, and was despised, mocked, and sneered at on every occasion. It happened that the eldest wanted to go into the forest to hew wood, and before he went, his mother gave him a beautiful sweet cake and a bottle of wine in order that he might not suffer from hunger or thirst. When he entered the forest, he met a little gray-haired man who bade him good day, and said, Do give me a piece of cake out of your pocket, and let me have a draught of your wine. I am so hungry and thirsty. But the clever son answered, If I give you my cake and wine, I shall have none for myself. Be off with you. And he left the little man standing and went on. But when he began to hew down a tree, it was not long before he made a false stroke, and the axe cut him in the arm, so that he had to go home and have it bound up, and this was the little gray man's doing. After this, the second son went into the forest, and his mother gave him, like the eldest, a cake and a bottle of wine. The little old gray man met him likewise, and asked him for a piece of cake and a drink of wine, but the second son too said sensibly enough, 
What I give you will be taken away from myself. Be off. And he left the little man standing and went on. His punishment, however, was not delayed. When he had made a few blows at the tree, he struck himself in the leg so that he had to be carried home. Then Dumling said, Father, do let me go and cut wood. The father answered, Your brothers have hurt themselves with it. Leave it alone. You do not understand anything about it. But Dumling begged so long that at last he said, Just go then. You will get wiser by hurting yourself. His mother gave him a cake made with water and baked in the cinders, and with it a bottle of sour beer. When he came to the forest, the little old gray man met him likewise, and greeting him, said, Give me a piece of your cake and a drink of your bottle. I am so hungry and thirsty. Dumbling answered, I have only cinder cake and sour beer. If that pleases you, we will sit down and eat. So they sat down. And when Dumbling pulled out a cinder cake, it was a fine sweet cake, and the sour beer had become good wine. So they ate and drank, and after that, the little old man said, Since you have a good heart, and are willing to divide what you have, I will give you good luck. There stands an old tree. Cut it down, and you will find something at the roots. And then the little man took leave of him. Dumbling went and cut down the tree. And when it fell, there was a goose sitting in the roots with feathers of pure gold. He lifted her up, and taking her with him, went to an inn where he thought he would stay the night. Now the host had three daughters, who saw the goose, and were curious to know what such a wonderful bird might be, and would have liked to have one of its golden feathers. The eldest thought, I shall soon find an opportunity of pulling out a feather, and as soon as Dumbling had gone out, she seized the goose by the wing, but her finger and hand remained sticking fast to it. The second came soon afterwards, thinking only of how she might get a feather for herself, but she had scarcely touched her sister than she was held fast. At last, the third also came with the like intent, and the others screamed out, Keep away! For God's sake, keep away! But she did not understand why she was to keep away. The others are there, she thought. I may as well be there too. And she ran to them. But as soon as she had touched her sister, she remained sticking fast to her. So they had to spend the night stuck to the goose. The next morning, Dumbling took the goose under his arm and set out, without troubling himself about the three girls who were hanging on to it. They were obliged to run after him continually, now left, now right, wherever his legs took them. In the middle of the fields, the parson met them, and when he saw the procession, he said, For shame, you good-for-nothing girls. Why are you running across the fields after this young man? Is that seemly? At the same time he seized the youngest by the hand in order to pull her away, but as soon as he touched her, he likewise was stuck fast, and was himself obliged to run behind as well. Before long the sexton came by and saw his master, the parson, running behind three girls. He was astonished at this and called out, Hi, your reverence! Whither away so quickly? Do not forget that we have a christening today. And running after him, he took him by the sleeve, but was also held fast to it as soon as he touched him. Whilst the five were trotting thus one behind the other, two laborers came with their hoes from the fields. The parson called out to them and begged that they would set him and the sexton free, but they had scarcely touched the sexton when they were held fast as well, and now there were seven of them running behind Dumbling and the Goose. Soon afterwards he came to a city, where a king ruled who had a daughter who was so serious that no one could make her laugh, so he had put forth a decree that whoever should be able to make her laugh should marry her. When Dumbling heard this, he went with his goose and all of her train before the king's daughter, and as soon as she saw the seven people running on and on, one behind the other, she began to laugh quite loudly and as if she would never stop. Thereupon Dumbling asked to have her for his wife, but the king did not like the son-in-law, and made all manner of excuses, and said he must first produce a man who could drink a cellar full of wine. Dumbling thought of the little gray man, who could certainly help him. So he went to the forest, and in the same place where he had felled the tree, he saw a man sitting, who had a very sorrowful face. Dumbling asked him what he was taking to heart so sorely, and he answered, I have such a great thirst, and cannot quench it. Cold water I cannot stand. A barrel of wine I have just emptied, but that to me is like a drop on a hot stone. Well there, I can help you, said Dumbling. 
Just come with me and you shall be satisfied. He led him into the king's cellar, and the man bent over the huge barrels and drank and drank until his loins hurt, and before the day was out, he had emptied all of the barrels. Then Dumbling asked once more for his bride, but the king was vexed that such an ugly fellow, whom everyone called Dumbling, should take away his daughter, and he made a new condition, that Dumbling must first find a man who could eat a whole mountain of bread. Dumbling did not think long, but went straight into the forest, where in the same place there sat a man who was tying up his body with a strap, and making an awful face, and saying, I have eaten a whole oven full of rolls, but what good is that when one has such a hunger as I? My stomach remains empty, and I must tie myself up if I am not to die of hunger. At this, Dumbling was glad, and said, Get up and come with me, you shall eat yourself full. He led him to the king's palace, where all the flour in the whole kingdom was collected, and from it he caused a huge mountain of bread to be baked. The man from the forest stood before it, began to eat, and by the end of the day the whole mountain had vanished. Then Dumbling for the third time asked for his bride, but the king again sought a way out, and ordered a ship which could sail on land and on water. As soon as you come sailing back in it, said he, you shall have my daughter for wife. Dumbling went straight into the forest, and there sat the little gray man to whom he had given his cake. When he heard what Dumbling wanted, he said, Since you have given me to eat and drink, I will give you the ship, and I do all of this because you once were kind to me. And then he gave him the ship, which could sail on land and water, and when the king saw that, he could no longer prevent him from having his daughter. The wedding was celebrated, and after the king's death, Dumbling inherited his kingdom and lived for a long time contentedly with his wife. All a lie howl. There was once upon a time a king who had a wife with golden hair, and she was so beautiful that her equal was not to be found on earth. It came to pass that she lay ill, and as she felt that she must soon die, she called the king and said, If you wish to marry again after my death, take no one who was not quite as beautiful as I am, and who has not just such golden hair as I have. This you must promise me. And after the king had promised her this, she closed her eyes, and she died. For a long time the king could not be comforted, and had no thought of taking another wife. At length his counselor said, This cannot go on. The king must marry again, and we may have a queen. And now messengers were sent about far and wide to seek a bride who equaled the late queen in beauty. In the whole world, however, none was to be found, and even if one had been found, still, there would have been no one who had such golden hair. So the messengers came home just as they had went. Now the king had a daughter, who was just as beautiful as her dead mother, and had the same golden hair. And when she was grown up, the king looked at her one day, and saw that in every respect she was like his late wife, and suddenly he felt a violent love for her. Then he spoke to his counselors. I will marry my daughter, for she is the counterpart of my late wife, otherwise I can find no bride who resembles her. When the counselors heard that, they were shocked, and said, God has forbidden a father to marry his daughter. No good can come from such a crime, and the kingdom will be involved in the ruin. The daughter was still more shocked when she became aware of her father's resolution, but hoped to turn him from his design. Then she said to him, Before I will fulfill your wish, I must have three dresses, one as golden as the sun, one as silvery as the moon, and one as bright as the stars. Besides this, I wish for a mantle of a thousand different kinds of fur and peltry joined together, and one of every kind of animal in your kingdom must give a piece of his skin for it, for she thought to get all that would be quite impossible, and thus I shall divert my father from his wicked intentions. The king, however, did not give it up, and the cleverest maidens in his kingdom had to weave the three dresses, one as golden as the sun, one as silvery as the moon, and one as bright as the stars, and his huntsmen had to catch one of every kind of animal in the whole kingdom and take from it one piece of its skin, and out of these was made a mantle of a thousand different kinds of fur. At length, when all was ready, the king caused the mantle to be brought, spread it out before her, and said, Our wedding shall be tomorrow. When therefore the king's daughter saw that there was no longer any hope of turning her father's heart, 
she resolved to run away. In the night, whilst everyone was asleep, she got up and took three different things from her treasures, a golden ring, a golden spinning wheel, and a golden reel. The three dresses of the sun, the moon, and the stars she placed into a nutshell, put on her mantle of all kinds of fur, and blackened her face and hands with soot. Then she commended herself to God, and went away, and walked the whole night until she reached a great forest, and as she was tired, she got into a hollow tree, and she fell asleep. The sun rose, and she slept on, and she was still sleeping when it was full day. Then it so happened that the king to whom this forest belonged was hunting in it. When his dogs came to the tree, they sniffed and ran barking all around it. The king said to the huntsman, Just see what kind of wild beast has hidden itself in there. The huntsman obeyed his order, and when they came back they said, A wondrous beast is lying in this hollow tree. We have never before seen one like it. Its skin is fur of a thousand different kinds, but it is lying asleep, said the king. See if you can catch it alive, and then fasten it to the carriage and we will take it with us. When the huntsman laid hold of the maiden, she awoke full of terror and cried to them, I am a poor child, deserted by father and mother. Have pity on me and take me with you. Then they said, Alalihau, you will be useful in the kitchen. Come with us and you can sweep up the ashes. So they put her in the carriage and took her home to the royal palace, where they had pointed out to her a closet under the stairs where no daylight entered, and said, Hairy animal, there you can live and sleep. Then she was sent into the kitchen, and there she carried wood and water, swept the hearth, plucked the fowls, picked the vegetables, raked the ashes, and did all of the dirty work. All the Lihau lived there for a long time in a great wretchedness. Alas, fair princess, what is to become of you now? It happened, however, that one day a feast was held in the palace, and she said to the cook, May I go upstairs for a while and look on? I will place myself outside the door. The cook answered, Yes, go, but you must be back here in a half an hour to sweep the hearth. Then she took her oil lamp, went into her den, put off her dress of fur, and washed the soot off of her face and hands, so that her full beauty once more came to light, and she opened the nut, and took out her dress which shone like the sun, and when she had done that, she went up to the festival, and every one made way for her, for no one knew her, and thought no otherwise than that she was the king's daughter. The king came to meet her, gave his hand to her, and danced with her, and thought in his heart, my eyes have never yet seen anyone so beautiful. And when the dance was over, she curtsied, and when the king looked around again, she had vanished, and no one knew whether. The guards who stood outside the palace were called in question, but no one had seen her. She had run into her little den, however. There, she had quickly taken off her dress, made her face and hands black again, put on the mantle of fur, and again was all her lie how. And now, when she went into the kitchen, and was about to get to her work and sweep up the ashes, the cook said, Leave that alone until morning, and make me the soup for the king. I, too, will go upstairs for a while, and take a look. But let no hairs fall in, or in the future you shall have nothing to eat. So the cook went away, and all Elihau made the soup for the king, and made bread and soup the best that she could. And when it was ready, she fetched her golden ring from her little den, and put it in the bowl in which the soup was served. When the dancing was over, the king had his soup brought and ate it and he liked it so much that it seemed to him he had never tasted better. But when he came to the bottom of the bowl, he saw a golden ring lying, and he could not conceive how it could have gotten there. Then he ordered the cook to appear before him. The cook was terrified when he heard the order, and said to Alilaihau, You have certainly let a hair fall into the soup, and if you have, you shall be beaten for it. When he came before the king, the latter asked who had made the soup. The cook replied, I have made it. But the king said, that is not true, for it was much better than usual, and cooked differently. He answered, I must acknowledge that I did not make it. It was made by the hairy animal. The king said, Go, go and bid it comes up here. When Allah Laihau came, the king said, Who are you? I am a poor girl who no longer has any father or mother. He asked further, Of what use are you in my palace? She answered, I am good for nothing but to have boots thrown at my head. He continued, Where did you get the ring which was in the soup? She answered, I know nothing about the ring. So the king could learn nothing, and he had to send her away again. 
After a while, there was another festival, and then, as before, Alalaihau begged the cook for leave and to go and look on. He answered, Yes, but come back again in a half an hour, and make the king the bread soup which he so much likes. Then she ran into her den, washed herself quickly, and took out of the nut the dress which was as silvery as the moon, and put it on. Then she went up, and was like a princess, and the king stepped forward to meet her, and rejoiced to see her once more, and as the dance was just beginning, they danced it together. But when it was ended, she again disappeared so quickly that the king could not observe where she went. She, however, sprang into her den, and once more made herself a hairy animal, and went into the kitchen to prepare the bread soup. When the cook had gone upstairs, she fetched the little golden spinning wheel and put it in the bowl so that the soup covered it. Then it was taken to the king, who ate it, and he liked it as much as before, and he had the cook brought forth, who this time likewise was forced to confess that Alalaihau had prepared the soup. Alalaihau again came before the king, but she answered that she was good for nothing else but to have boots thrown at her head, and that she knew nothing at all about the little golden spinning wheel. When, for the third time, the king held a festival, all happened just as it had done before. The cook said, Furskin, you are a witch, and always put something in the soup which makes it so good that the king likes it better than that which I cook. But as she begged so hard, he let her go up at the appointed time, and now she put on the dress which shone like the stars, and thus entered the hall. Again, the king danced with the beautiful maiden, and thought that she never yet had been so beautiful. And while she was dancing, he contrived, without her noticing it, to slip a golden ring on her finger, and he had given orders that the dance should last a very long time. When it was finally ended, he wanted to hold her fast by the hands, but she tore herself loose and sprang away so quickly through the crowd that she vanished from his sight. She ran as fast as she could into her den beneath the stairs, but as she had been too long and had stayed more than half an hour, she could not take off her pretty dress, but only threw it over her mantle of fur, and in her haste she did not, she did not make herself quite black but one finger remained white. Then Alalaihau ran into the kitchen and cooked the bread soup for the king, and as the cook was away, she put her golden reel into it. When the king found the reel at the bottom of it, he caused Alalaihau to be summoned, and then he espied the white finger and saw the ring which he had put on it during the dance. Then he grasped her by the hand and held her fast, and when she wanted to release herself and run away, her mantle of fur opened a little, and the star dress shone forth. The king clutched the mantle and tore it off. Then her golden hair shone forth, and she stood there in full splendor, and could no longer hide herself. And when she had washed the soot and ashes from her face, she was more beautiful than anyone who had ever been seen on earth. Then the king said, Now you are to be my dear bride, and we will never more part from each other. Thereupon, their marriage was solemnized, and they lived happily until their death. The Three Feathers There was once upon a time a king who had three sons, of whom two were clever and wise, but the third did not speak much, and was simple, and was called the Simpleton. When the king had become old and weak, and was thinking of his end, he did not know which of his sons should inherit the kingdom after him. Then he said to them, Go forth, and he who brings me the most beautiful carpet shall be king after my death and that there should be no dispute amongst them, he took them outside his castle, blew three feathers in the air, and said, You shall go as they fly. One feather flew to the east, the other to the west, but the third flew straight up and did not fly far, but soon fell to the ground. And now one brother went to the right, and the other to the left, and they mocked Simpleton, who was forced to stay where the third feather had fallen. He sat down and was sad. Then, all at once, he saw that there was a trap door close by the feather. He raised it up, found some steps, and went down them. Then he came to another door. He knocked upon it, and he heard somebody inside calling, Little green waiting maid, waiting maid with the limping leg, little dog of the limping leg, hop hither and thither, and quickly see who is without. The door opened, and he saw a great fat toad sitting, and all around her were a crowd of little toads. The fat toad asked what he wanted. He answered, 
I should like to have the prettiest and finest carpet in the world. Then she called a young one and said, Little green waiting maid, waiting maid with the limping leg, little dog of the limping leg, hop hither and thither and bring me the great box. The young toad brought the box and the fat toad opened it and gave Simpleton a carpet out of it, so beautiful and fine that on the earth above none could have been woven like it. Then he thanked her and climbed out again. The two others, however, had looked on their youngest brother as so stupid that they believed he would find and bring nothing at all. Why should we give ourselves a great deal of trouble searching, said they, and got some coarse handkerchiefs from the first shepherd's wives whom they met and carried them home to the king. At the same time, Simpleton also came back and brought his beautiful carpet, and when the king saw it, he was astonished and said, If justice be done, the kingdom belongs to the youngest. But the two others let their father have no peace, and said it was impossible that Simpleton, who in everything lacked understanding, should be king, and entreated him to make a new agreement with them. Then the father said, He who brings me the most beautiful ring shall inherit the kingdom. And he led the three brothers out, and blew into the air three feathers which they were to follow. Those of the two eldest again went east and west, and Simpleton's feather flew straight up and fell down near the door into the earth. Then he went down again to find the fat toad, and told her that he wanted the most beautiful ring. She at once ordered her big box to be brought, and gave him a ring out of it, which sparkled with jewels and was so beautiful that no goldsmith on earth would have been able to make it. The two eldest laughed at Simpleton for going to seek a golden ring. They gave themselves no trouble, but knocked the nails out of an old carriage ring and took it to the king. But when Simpleton produced his golden ring, his father again said, The kingdom belongs to him. The two eldest did not cease from tormenting the king until he made a third condition and declared that the one who brought the most beautiful woman home should have the kingdom. He again blew the three feathers into the air, and they flew just as before. Then Simpleton, without more ado, went down to the fat toad and said, I am to take home the most beautiful woman. Oh, answered the toad, the most beautiful woman. She is not at hand at the moment, but still you shall have her. She gave him a yellow turnip which had been hollowed out, to which six mice were harnessed. Then Simpleton said quite mournfully, What am I to do with that? The toad answered, just put one of my little toads into it. Then he seized one at random out of the circle and put her into the yellow coach. But hardly was she seated in sight of it than she turned into a wonderfully beautiful maiden and the turnip into a coach and the six mice into horses. So Simpleton kissed her and he drove off quickly with the horses and took her to the king. His brothers, who came afterwards, had given themselves no trouble at all looking for beautiful girls and had brought with them the first peasant woman they chanced to meet. When the king saw them, he said, After my death, the kingdom belongs to my youngest son. But the two eldest deafened the king's ears afresh with their clamor. We cannot consent to Simpleton being king. They demanded that the one whose wife could leap through a ring which hung in the center of the hall should have the preference. They thought, the peasant woman can do that easily. They're strong enough, but the delicate maiden will jump herself to death. The aged king agreed likewise to this. Then the two peasant women jumped and jumped through the ring, but they were so clumsy that they fell, and their coarse arms and legs broke in two. And then the pretty maiden, who Simpleton brought home with him, sprang and sprang, sprang through as lightly as a deer, and all the opposition had to cease. So as it was, Simpleton received the crown, and he has ruled the kingdom wisely for a long length of time.